Okay, so to today I'm going to read from a book called Japanese Myths and Tales, and basically what this entails is a bunch of Japanese myths and tales. I'm going to be reading from page 108 to start, which is called, the story of this is the bamboo cutter and the moon maiden. So anyway, here, let's get started. Long ago, three li there lived an old bamboo cutter by the name of S Snagi, Snugi no Miyaku. One day, while he was busy with his hatchet in a grove of bamboos, he suddenly perceived a miraculous light, and on closer inspection discovered it in the heart of a reed a very small creature of exquisite beauty. He gently picked up the tiny girl, only about four inches in height, and carried her home to his wife. So delicate was the little maiden that she had to be reared in a basket. Now it happens that the bank bootcutter continued to sit about his business, and nine day he would, as he cut, would cut down reeds, he found gold, and once poor, he now amassed a considerable fortune. The child, after she had been but three months old, with the, his simple country folk, suddenly grew in stature to that of a full-grown maid, and in order that she should be in keeping with such a pleasing if surprising event, her hair, ethereal, allowed to flow in long tresses about her shoulders. She was now fastened into a knot on her head. In due seasons, the bamboo cutter named the girl the Lady Kaguya, a precious slender bamboo of the field of autumn. When she had been named after a great feast was held, in which all the neighbors participated. The next surprise Emmy Pipe story to this is the wing of the precious slender bamboo of the field of bottom, aka the Lady of Kaguya. Now, the Lady of Kaguya was all of women the most beautiful, and immediately after the feast, the fame of her beauty spread through the land. Would be lovers gathered around the fence and lingered in the porch with the hope of at least getting a glimpse of this lovely maiden. Night and day, these forlorn suitors waited, but in vain. Those who were of humble origin gradually began to recognize that their lovemaking was useless. But five wealthy suitors still persisted and would not relax their efforts. They were Prince Ishikuri and Prince Kuromachi, the Saint Ajin Dinagon, Abe no Mishi, the Chingon Otomo no Miyuki, and Murata, the Lord of Isa. These ardent lovers bore the ice and snow of winter and the thunderous heat of midsummer with equal fortitude. When these lords finally asked the bamboo cutter to bestow his daughter upon one of them, the old man politely explained the maiden was not the, his, really his daughter, and as the, was so she could not be compelled to obey his, his own wishes in the matter. At, the, at last the lords returned to their mansions, but still continued to make their applications more persistent than ever. E even the kindly bamboo cutter began to remonstrate with the Lady Kaguya, and to point out that it was becoming for some handsome a maid to marry, and that among the five noble suitors she could surely make a very good match. To this the wise Kaguya replied, No, so fair am I that I may be certain of a man's faith. And were I to mate with one of those heart proved fickle, the miserable fate were mine. Noble lords, without doubt, are these of whom thou speakest. But I would not wed a man whose heart should be all untried and unknown. It was finally arranged that Kaguya should marry the suitor who proved himself the most worthy. <clears throat> this news brought monetary hope to the five great lords, and when night came to they assembled before the house where the maiden dwelt. With flute music and the singing, with chanting to accompaniments and piping, with candence, tap, and clap of fan, only the, the bamboo cutter went out to thank the lords for their serenading. When he had come into the house again, Kagua thus set forth her plan to test the stews. In Tenjiki, the north of India, is a beggar bowl of stone which a bowl the Buddha himself bore. In quest whereof, let Prince Ishikuri depart and bring me the same. 
And on mount the mountain, her I, the towers over the eastern ocean, grow a tree with the roots of silver and trunk of gold, and fruit age of pure white jade. And I bid Prince Karam and Chief fare er, thither, and break off and bring me a branch thereof. Again, in the land of Marshki, men fashion fur robes of the pelt of the flame proof red. And I pray the Dinigan to find me one such. Then, of the Chunigan, I require the rainbow hued jewel that hides a spark deep in the dragon's head. And from the hands of the Lord Iso would I fain receive the tarry shell that the swallow brings hither over the broad sea plain. The begging bowl of the Lord Buddha. The Prince Ishiku, after pondering over the matter of going to distant Tenjuku in search of the Lord Buddha's begging bowl, came to the conclusion that such a proceeding would be futile. He decided, therefore, to counter with the bowl in question. He laid his plans cunningly and took care good care of the, the Lady of Kaguya, who was informed that he had actually undertaken the journey. As a matter of fact, this artful suitor hid in Yamato for three years, and after the time discovered a hill monastery of Ntuchi, a bowl of extreme age resting upon the altar of Benzuru, the sorcerer in sickness. This bowl he took away with him, and wrapped in a brocade, and attached to the gift an artificial branch of blossom. When the Lady Kaguya looked upon the bowl, she found inside a scroll containing the following, Overseas, over hills, bath but thy servant beard, and weary and weary wayworn he perceived. Oh, what tears had cost this bowl of stone, what blood of streaming tears. But when the, he, the Lady Kaguya perceived that no light shone from the vessel, she at once knew that it had never belonged to the Lord Buddha. She accordingly sent the, back the bowl with the following verse. Of the hanging dewdrop, not even the passing change wells heron. On the hill of darkness, the hill of Ogura, what couldst thou hope to find? The prince, having thrown away the bowl, sought to return the remonstrance into a compliment to the lady who wrote, Nay, on the hill of brightness, what splendor will not pale? Would that away from the light of the beauty, the sheen of yonder, bowl might prove me true? It was a pretty turn compliment by a suitor who was an utter humbug. The latest poetical sally availed nothing, and the prince sadly departed. The jewel bearing branch of Mount Harai. Prince Kuramachi, like his predecessor, was equally will wily and made it generally known that he was setting out on a journey to the land of Tsuki in quest of the jewel bearing branch. What he actually did was to employ six men of the Ichimaro family, celebrated craftsmen, and secure them the dwell uh, dwelling, hiding from the haunts of men. Where he himself abode for the purpose of craftsmen, craftsmen as to how they were to make a jeweled bearing branch identical with the one described by the Lady Gagua. When the jewel bearing branch was finished, he set out to wait upon the Lady Gagua, who read the following verse attached to the gift. Though it were at the peril of my very life, without the jeweled land branch in my hands, never again would I have to dared to return. The Lady Gagua looked sadly upon this glittering branch and listened without interest. To the prince's purely imaginative story of his adventures, the prince dwelled upon the terrors of the sea of strange monsters, of acute hunger, of disease which were the trials upon the ocean. And when this incredibly incredible storyteller went on to describe how they came to a high mountain rising out of the sea, where they were greeted by a woman bearing a silver vessel, which she filled with water. On the mountain, her wonderful flowers and trees, and a stream of rainbow-hued, yellow as gold, white as silver, blue as precious ruby, black as lazuli, and that stream was spanned by bridges, built up of divers gems, and a group tree is done with dazzled jewels, dazzling jewels, and from one of these I broke off the branch, which I venture now to offer to the Lady Kaguya. Now the, the Lady Kaguya would have been forced to believe this ingenious tale had not at the very moment, the six craftsmen appeared on the scene, and by loudly demanding payment for the ready-made jewel branch, exposed on the treachery of the prince, who made hasty retreat. The Lady Kaguya herself rewarded the craftsmen, happy, no doubt, to escape so easily. The flame-proof fur robe. 
Besajin of Great Minister, Ape no Mishu, Mission to Mershin, by the name of Woki, to obtain for him a fur room made from the front land for at. When the merchant ship had returned from the land of Marshki and bore a fur robe which the sanguine Sajin imagined to be a very object of his desire, the fur robe rested in a casket, and the Sajin believed honestly the merchant describing it as being of a sea green color, the hair tipped with shining gold, a treasure indeed, comparable loveliness more to the admirer for his your excellence than even for his virtue, resisting the flame of fire. The Sajin assured the success of his wooing, gaily said, oh, to present his gift to the Lady Kaguya, offering an additional fo the following verse. <clears throat> Unless there are the fires of love that consume me, yet unconsumed is this robe of fur. Dry is at last are my sleeves, for shall I not see her face this day? This last the shattered Jin was able to present his gift to the Kaguya, thus she addressed the bamboo cutter, who always seemed to have been conveniently on the steam at such times. If this robe be thrown amid the flames, and not, be not burnt up, I shall know it is a very truth the flame-proof robe, and may no longer refuse this with suits. A fair fire was lit, light, lighted, and the robe thrown into the flames, where it perished immediately. And the sergeant saw that his face grew green as grass, and he stood there, astonished by the Lady Kaga, discreetly tripped her dice and returned the casket with the following seat first, without a vestige even left, thus to burn utterly away. Had I dreamt of, of, of this robe of fur, alas, the anything fire otherwise would have I have would have dealt with. It, and the next is the jewel of the dragon head. Shiniku Atomo no Miyuki assembled his household and informed the retainers that he had desired them to bring him the jewel of the dragon head. After some more, they pretended to set off on this quest. In the meantime, the Shingon was sure to, of his servant's success that he had his hope slavishly adorned through with exquisite lacquer work in gold and silver. Every room was hung with brocade, panels rich with pictures, and over the roof were silken clothes. Weary of waiting, the Shingon, after a time journey to Ninwa, and questioned the inhabitants of any of his servants had taken a boat in quest of the dragon. The Shingon learns that none of his men had come to Ninwa, and considerably displeased at the news, he himself embarked with his with Helmsen. Now it happened that the Thunder God was angry, and the sea ran high. After many days, the storm grew so severe, and the boat was so near sinking that the helmsman ventured to remark the howling of the wind and the raging of the waves and the mighty roar of the thunder are signs of the wrath of the god whom my lord offends who would slay the dragon of the deep for the through the dragon is stormed to raise and well it was for my lord to offer a prayer as the true den had been seized with a terrible sickness it is not surprising to find that he had really took the helmsman's advice he prayed no less than a thousand times enlarging on his holy and attempted to slay the dragon, and solemnly vowed that he would leave the ruler of the deep in peace. The thunder ceased and the clouds disappeared, but the wind was as fierce as strong as ever. Elspin, however, told his master that it was a fair wind and blew towards their homeland. At last he reached the strand of Akashi and Harama, but the Chungan, still ill and lightly friend, vowed that they had been driven upon a savage shore and lay full length in the boat, bending heavily and refusing to rise when the governor of the district presented himself. When the Shinigan at last realized that he had not been blown upon some savage shore, he consented to land. No wonder, the governor smiled, when he saw the wretched appearance of the discomfort lord, chilled to the very bone with swollen belly and eyes, lustrous and as, as slows. At the length of the Jinigan was carried in a litter to his own home. What? When he had arrived, his cunning servants humbly told their master how they had failed in the quest. Thus, the Jinigan greeted them. You have done well to return empty-handed. Founder Dragon really has kinship with the Thunder God, and no, however shall lay hands on him to take the jewel of the queens in his head shall find themselves in peril. Myself am sore spent with toil and hardship, and no Gorodon have I won. 
a thief of men's souls and a destroyer of their bodies is the lady faggot nor ever will i seek her about again nor even bend your ye steps to the word when the woman of his household heard of their lord's adventure they laughed till their eyes were sore while the sickling clothes he had caused to be drawn over the roof of his mansion were carried away thread by thread by the crows to line their nest with the royal line now for the the fame of the lady Cagliars we reached the court, and the Mikadal, anxious to gaze upon her, said, One of his pals, ladies, Saga, to go and see the bamboo cutter's daughter, and to report to his majesty of her excellence. However, when Saga reached the bamboo cutter house, the lady Kaga refused to see her, so the palace lady returned to the court and reported the matter to Mikadal. His majesty, not a little displeased, sent for the bamboo cutter and made him bring the Lady Gaga to court, that he might see her riding. A hat of nobility, perchance, shall be her father's reward. The old bamboo cutter was in Marl's soul, and mildly discontented with his daughter's extraordinary behavior. Although he loved court favors, and probably hankered after so distinguished a hat, it is must be said of him that he was the first of all true to his duty as a father. When on returning, to his home, he discussed the matter with the Lady Kagura. She informed the old man that if she were compelled to go to court, it would certainly cause her death, aiding the price of my father's hat of nobility will be the destruction of her this child. The American cutter was deeply affected by these words, and once more set out on a journey to the court, where he humbly made known his daughter's decision to Mikada. Not to be denied even by an extraordinary beautiful woman hit on the ingenious plan of ordering a royal hunt, so arranged that he might unexpectedly arrive at the bamboo cutter's dwelling, and perchance see the lady who could set a defiance of desires to, of an emperor. On the day appointed by the royal hunt, therefore, the Mikadao entered the bamboo cutter's house, he had no sooner done so that he was surprised to see, in the room in which he stood, a wonderful light, and the light none other than the Lady Kagua. From his majesty advanced and touched the main sleeve. Whereupon she hid her face, but not before the Mikadao had caught a glimpse of her beauty. Amazed by her extreme loveliness, and taking no notice of her protest, he ordered a place palace litter to be brought, but on its arrival, Lady Kaya suddenly vanished. The Emperor, perceiving that he was dealing with no mortal maid, exclaimed, It shall be thou, dearest maiden, but tis prayed that thou resume thy form that once more thy beauty may be seen. So Lady Kaguya resumed her fair form again. As his majesty was about to be borne away, he composed the following verse. Mournful the return of the royal hunt, and full of sorrow the brooding heart. For she resists and stays behind the Lady Kaguya. The Lady Kaguya thus made answer. Under the roof of Ogre Garn, with hope lying, long were the years she passed. How many she dared to look upon the piles of precious jade. The celestial robes of feathers. In the third year after the royal hunt, and in the springtime, Lady Kaguya continually gazed at the moon. On the seventh month, when the moon was full, the Lady Kaguya's sorrow increased, so that her weeping distressed the maidens who served her. At last, they came to the bamboo cutter and said, Long has the Lady Kaguya watched the moon waxing and uncollily, with the waxing thereof, and her woe now past his own measure, and slowly she weeps and wails, wherever or we console thee to speak with her. When the man who cut a community with his daughter, he requested that she shall tell him the cause of her sorrow, and was informed that she sight on the moon caused her to reflect upon the wretchedness of the world. During the eighth month, the Lady Kaguya explained to her maids that she was no ordinary mortal, but that her birthplace was the capital of Moonland, and that the time was now at hand when she was destined to leave the world and return to her old home. Not only was the bamboo cutter heartbroken at this sorrowful news, but McDowell was also considerably troubled when he heard that of the purpose departure of the Lady Kaguya. His majesty was informed that at the next full moon, the company would be sent down from the shining orb to take this beautiful lady away. 
Whereupon he determined to put a check upon this list of invasion. He ordered it that a guard of soldiers should be stationed at the bank of Bucutter's house, armed and prepared, if need be, to shoot their heirs upon the moon folk, those moon folk, who would fain take the beautiful Lady Kagyo away. The old bamboo cutter naturally thought that with such a guard to protect his daughter, the invasion from the moon would prove utterly futile. But Lady Kagyo attempted to correct this old man's ideas on subject thing. You cannot prevail over the folk of Yonderland. Nor will your artillery harm them, nor your defenses avail against them. For your, every door will fly open at their approach. Nor may your valor help, for be you never so stout-hearted, and the moonful common vein will be your struggle. With them, these remarks made the bamboo cutter exceedingly angry. He asserted that his nails would turn into talons. In short, that he would completely annihilate such abundant visitors from the moon. Now, while the royal guard were stationed about the bamboo cutter's house, on the roof in every direction, the night wore away. At the hour of the rather greater glory, exceeding the splendor of the moon and stars shone around. While the light still continued, a strange cloud approached, bearing upon it a company of moon folk. The cloud slowly descended until it came near the, the ground, and the moon folk assembled themselves in order. When the royal guard perceived them, every soldier grew afraid of the strangest spectacle, but I think some of the other number summoned up sufficient courage to bend their bows and send their arrows flying. But all their shafts went astray. On the cloud there rested a canopy a car, which was and it with curtains of finest woolen fabric. From the car a mighty voice sounded, saying, Come thou forth, Miyaku Maro. The bamboo cutter tottered forth to obey the summons, and received for his pains an address from the chief of the moon folk, and sing with thou fool, and ended up with a common that the Lady Kagyu should be given up without further delay. A car floated upward upon the cloud till it hovered over the roof. Once again, the same mighty voice shouted, Oh there, Kagyu, how long one will tarry in this sorry place? Immediately the outer door of the storehouse and the inner lattice work were opened by the power of the moon folk and revealed that Lady Kagyu and her woman gathered butter. The Lady Kagyu, before taking her departure, made the prostrate bamboo cutter and gave him a scroll bearing these words. Had I been born in this land, I never should have I quitted until the time came for my father to suffer no sorrow for this shot, his child. But now, on the contrary, I must pass beyond the boundaries of this world, though sorrowly against my will, my silken mantle I leave behind me as a memorial. And when the moon lights up the night, let me, my father gaze upon it. Now my eyes must take their last look and must mount to yonder sky. Once I faint, it would fall. Meteor wise to earth. Now the moon folk have brought with them in a coffer, a celestial feather robe, and a few drops of the elixir of life. Mom said to the Lady Gaga, Taste, I pray you, of the elixir, if her soul has your spirit become with the grossness of this filthy world. The Lady Gaga, after tasting the elixir, was about to wrap up some in the mantle. She was leaving behind for the benefit of the bamboo cutter, who had loved her so well. One, one of the moon folk prevented her, and attempted to throw her over the shoulders of the celestial rope. When the Lady Kagyu exclaimed, Have patience yet a while, Udon's yonder robe changes his head, and I was still somewhat to say, Here I depart. Then she proceeded to write the following to the Mikadal. Your Majesty deigned to send a host to protect your servant. But it was not to be, and now is the misery of at hand, of departing with those who have come to bear her away with them. No permitted was it to her to serve your majesty, and despite her will, was it that she yielded not obedience to the royal command, and wrung with grief, it is her heart thereafter. And perchance your majesty may have thought the royal will was not understood. Was opposed by her. And so will she appear to your majesty lacking in good manners, which you would not, your majesty, deem her to be. And therefore, humbly, she laid this writing at the royal feet. And now must she don the feather robe and mournfully bid her lord farewell. Having delivered the scroll into the hands of the captain of the host, together with a bamboo joint, 
containing the laser, the feather robe, was thrown over her, and in a moment of all memory of her earthly existence departed. Then the Lady Gaga entered the car surrounded by the company of Moonfolk, and the cloudy rapidly rose skyward till it lost to sight. The sorrow of the bamboo cutter of the Mikado knew no bounds. The latter held a grand council and inquired which was the highest mountain in the land. One of the counselors answered, In Sugra stands a mountain, not remote from the capital that towers highest towards heaven among all the mountains of the land. Whereupon his majesty composed the following verse. Never more to see her, tears of grief overwhelm me. And as for me, with the elixir of life, what have I do? When the scroll which Lady Kaguya had written, together with the elixir, was given to Suzuki no Izawasuka, there was a command to take the summit of the highest mountain in Sagra and stand upon the highest peak to burn the scroll and the elixir of life. So Suzuki no Inawasuka heard humbly the royal command and took with him a company of warriors and climbed the mountain and did as he was bidden, and was from that time forth the name Fuji, Fujiyama, ever dying, was given to yonder mountain, and men said that the smoke of that burning still curls from its eye peak to mingle with the clouds of heaven. So that's the end of that story. If you want me to read more of these, I'm totally down. That was kind of fun. I, I do want to find a better way to actually read them, though, instead of just, you know, having a screen and my audio, but, yeah. Oh, if you enjoyed that, please like and subscribe, and let me know if you want me to do more in the comments. See you!